Many of you have heard of Bing Crosby, the great singer and actor from the last century. And those of you who knew Bing and his entertaining skills may not have heard of one of his ancestors. Her name was Frances Crosby, better known as Fanny. She was born in 1820. And when she was about six weeks old, they noticed she had some eye infection the doctor gave her a treatment and tragically, disastrously, it left her blind for the rest of her life. When Fanny was about eight years old, she wrote a poem, and it was not the only poem she would write, and this is what it said. Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented, I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. This Fanny Bryce went on to become the most prolific writer of Christian hymns in the 19th century. She wrote thousands of hymns, extraordinary hymns and a great deal of poetry, about 1,000 poems. Maybe you've heard the hymn, Blessed Assurance. That was from her hand. And towards the end of her life, she said, no, no, I wish never to see in this world because I'd be too distracted from the God that she sees in her heart. And she knew that when she would wake up in heaven, she would see the first face being Jesus himself. Today we hear the account of the encounter of Jesus with a blind man named Bartimaeus. And as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, this is his final journey, he's on his way for his execution. He, as we heard last week, said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life and ransom for many. So he'd come to save souls, that's the point. And then they come down, as they're coming down along the Jordan River, there's an ancient city. In fact, it may be the most ancient city in the world that we know continuously inhabited, called Jericho. Now, a thousand years plus before Jesus, you will recall that Moses and the children of Israel were making their way across the Jordan. Moses dies, Joshua, the general, takes over. And the first encounter they have is with the city of Jericho and they were enemies of the Israelites. In fact, Jericho was known as the sin city of the ancient world. You get the idea. They were to have nothing to do with it, but they marched around it, you will recall, until the walls came tumbling down. Now, a thousand years plus after that, Jesus is following the same route as the new Moses. He's coming across the Jordan and there they are at the old city of Jericho, still known as Sin City. And who is there? Bartimaeus. Now Bartimaeus was clearly a man who faced tremendous disadvantage because at the time there was no braille, right? That's a very recent gift for reading in braille for the blind. There was no social security, there was no protective net for him. It would appear he had no family or they had abandoned him and so all he could possibly do was beg. And you know we encounter beggars in our world. He was a man, he didn't choose this. This is where he found himself. And as Jesus is coming along the walls of Jericho, he hears news, right? And so he starts shouting, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And what do the crowds tell him? Shh, be quiet. Be, you're an embarrassment. Stop that. Shh, be quiet. Gee, he, he gets even louder. If he had listened to the crowds, he would maybe never have encountered Jesus. 
And don't we often have that experience? The crowds are telling us, oh, forget about it. Jesus doesn't care about you. Who is he anyway? All the negativity, right, in our world. Be a Bartimaeus. Call all the louder. And Jesus stops. He says, bring him to me. Oh boy, now their tune changes. Jesus is calling you. Get up. Come on, don't delay. Hurry up. Right, you know, fickle crowds that we are in this world. So Bartimaeus comes to Jesus and Jesus gives him this great dignity. He says, what do you want me to do for you? What is it that you want? What is the desire of your heart? It's a question Jesus asks us. What do you want me to do for you? And he could have said, well, I'd like you to give me a palace in Jerusalem. I'd like you to, you know, just fill in the blank, all the kinds of worldly things that we typically ask for. And instead he says, I want to see. And God gave him, at that very moment, he says, go forth, your faith has healed you. In other words, the trust that you put in me, that faith, is now what's bringing you your healing. And he immediately, upon seeing the face of Jesus, follows him. Jesus had told him, go on your way. Go about your business. You can see now. But instead, he follows Jesus because Jesus was the one who had given him this vision. You and I, most of us who have had our sight since birth, take it for granted. And we've had the ability to read and study the word of God, to come to know Jesus. And how many of us have not taken advantage of it. Bartimaeus, who could not see physically, and then later on, Fanny, who could not see, had an even deeper vision of God. What do we want to see? Will we seek the greatest vision? And that vision is called wisdom in the Bible. In fact, there's a whole book called the Book of Wisdom. This is how it starts. Love righteousness, you rulers of the earth. Think of the Lord with uprightness and seek him with sincerity of heart. Wisdom is a kindly spirit. Do not invite death by the error of your life, nor bring destruction by works of your hands, God did not make death and did not delight in the death of the living. He created all things that they might have being. God is the God of life. And God wants to give us eternal life. That's the vision that is put before us. You know, when St. John Paul helped us enter the new millennium, he wrote a beautiful document to help us do that. And in doing so, he wrote about the importance of a spirituality of communion, without which we will not enter into the new springtime of faith. This is what he said. Quote, to make the church the home and the school of communion, that is the great challenge facing us in the millennium which is now beginning. If we wish to be faithful to God's plan, and to respond to the world's deepest yearnings. But what does this mean in practice? Here too our thoughts could run immediately to the action to be undertaken, but that would not be the right impulse to follow. Before making practical plans, we need to promote a spirituality of communion, making it the guiding principle of education wherever individuals and Christians are formed. Wherever ministers of the altar, consecrated persons, pastoral workers are trained, wherever families and communities are being built up, a spirituality of communion indicates, above all, the heart's contemplation of the mystery of the Trinity dwelling in us, and whose light we must also be able to see shining on the face of our brothers and sisters around us. A spirituality of communion implies also the ability to see what is positive in others, to welcome it and prize it as a gift from God. 
It finally means to know how to make room for one another, bearing each other's burdens and resisting the selfish temptations which are constantly besetting us and provoking competition, careerism, distrust, and jealousy. Let us have no illusion. Unless we follow this spiritual path, external structures of communion will serve very little purpose. They would become mechanisms without a soul, masks of communion rather than its means of expression and growth. Spirituality of communion. We're not just talking about receiving Holy Communion, but once receiving Jesus, being communion for the world, being Jesus. That's the only thing that will change this world. When we hear about rejoicing in the book of Jeremiah, it was because they were coming back to the promised land. Do we have a vision of the promised land? We have Jesus who will bring us over the Jordan into that promised land. We have Jesus who will deliver us from our secret sins, like the city of Jericho. Many of us are battling sins of all kinds, right? We're battling maybe physical issues. Maybe we're battling problems in our own family or in our school or in our workplace. Jesus told St. Margaret Mary a la Coq, that there were three streams of grace coming out of his heart. And the first stream of grace pouring out of the sacred heart of Jesus is a stream of mercy. Bartimaeus called on Jesus, begged for his mercy, and he received it. In this case, it was a physical healing, but it was also a spiritual healing. Right? He could see Jesus and then he followed Jesus. Are we asking God for mercy? Or do we just sit and wallow in our sins, right? The second stream that pours out of his sacred heart is a stream of charity. That is to say, he impels us by his love to love one another. This world is in deep need of seeing the charity of Christ through us. This is Mission Sunday, World Mission Sunday. St. Paul talks about that the love of Christ urges us on, right? And then he says, God desires that all should be saved with the knowledge of truth. So this impelling us is that second movement from the heart of Jesus. And finally, it says, the third stream from his heart is a stream of light and love. Yes, this world is facing a great deal of darkness, but the light we have received moves us into mission. The last thing Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, before he ascends into heaven is, now go. He's commissioning us. He's giving us the mission. You know? He says, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. We baptized about a million Catholics all around the world. We've got lots of baptisms. Did I say a million? Wrong. It's a billion, right? 999 million plus Catholics registered around the world. So you figure it's about a billion. How many disciples have we got? What is a disciple of Jesus? The word disciple, discipulos, is a listener. Here we have it. Are we listening to his word and acting upon it? Is the light shining through us unto the nations? That's the challenge that we have. Bartimaeus is our example. Let's call on the Lord. No matter what we're fighting, no matter what sin may have a hold on us, call out to the mercy of Jesus and let his heart pour out these streams of grace, mercy, charity, light, and love. And then we will begin by discipling right here each of us personally, individually, and then parents discipling your children and church discipling whole communities that will make Jesus known and loved. Then, like Fanny Crosby, we will see into the heart of Jesus and we will sing, like the psalmist tells us today, the great mercy 
of Almighty God.